Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Space Chams podcast. I'm your host, Jim Murphy, and with me today is my co-host, Will Murphy, and we have a very special guest, don't we, Will? Absolutely, we do. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. Our special guest today is Colonel T.J. Creamer, a flown astronaut from NASA. It's fantastic. Colonel, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderfully, considering all the weather systems that we've been having of late and our COVID experience, but things are going good. And I'm glad to be here with you. We're glad to have you. It's very exciting. A uh, little introduction here. Uh, Colonel TJ Creamer was born in Arizona, grew up in Maryland, went to Loyola MD for his undergraduate. He went to MIT for his master's in physics. He's a Colonel in the U S army. He's a flown NASA astronaut with 163 days of flight time in space and he's currently a flight director at NASA. That's true. You got it right. Those are all true. I'm just stating facts right now. That's all I'm (laughs) doing. And actually, another little one. You said you spoke three languages. I do, actually. Have. Yeah. There you go. I like that one. I'm going to throw that in. Um, Colonel, should we get right into it? Go for it. Let's do it. All right. Did you always know you wanted to be an astronaut? So the, the short answer is no. I won't leave you hanging like that, though. Um, so as I went through, through school, and the instructors and teachers and profs were pushing me towards science and math just because I had a proclivity and interest. Then I got commissioned in the Army and went off and did Army things, and I kept choosing the, the difficult path. Of, if, you had a, if you had an option, it's like you can go easy or you can go hard, and I always felt bad if I didn't choose the hard path. I'd always wonder if I could do it. So I, through career choices, I ended up doing some hard things, and I kept turning to the hard side, to the hard side. And um, when you get old enough in the Army, the Army tells you, hey, we know you're primarily, primarily an aviator. That's great, but what do you else want to do as a secondary? And I mentioned research and development, and they said, great. And they sent me a free subscription to Research Development and Acquisition Magazine. And the very first issue I got, Inside back cover was an article entitled Typical Profile of an Army Astronaut. And I, and I look at that, I read that, I looked at that, and I went, holy cow. I didn't mention my hazel eyes or the crook in my nose, but that's my profile. And, and I'm really close to, to attaining this, this kind of mold. And so I started applying. It was, so it was completely fortuitous, to be quite honest with you. Um, and I applied, and I got asked to come to work at the Johnson Space Center as a supporting engineer, and basically was here for a couple of years to the next selection cycle, application cycle, and I was able to get an interview and fortunate enough to be, to be selected. That's great. Uh, it's obviously, that was the second most important interview of your life after this one. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, you absolutely named it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we, we got priorities. <laughs> but... That actually, so that question brings me to one I like to ask a lot. Um, I love space. My wonderful co-host here loves space, but I am a history major. And when you're working at NASA and in space, like, do you, do you work with an eclectic group of people that have different skills? Like, how does a history major get to work with someone like you? Um, you don't. Sorry. No, 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 that's, that's not true. And, and I'm kidding entirely. Um, the first thing I would say is there's an awful lot of technical stuff that we work on. Don't get me wrong. And an engineering, a math, a science background helps you on, on, on those fields. For instance, to work real time with me on the console, we're, we're going to have science and math or engineering oriented folks. However, on the other side of the coin, we're doing an awful lot of outreach. We're, off, we're doing an awful lot of what I would call society building things. Let me explain. The farther and farther away we go, so we're going to be shooting for the moon. We're going to be shooting for Mars. And the farther and farther we, we go, the more and more we're going to have to engage with an, um, an emplaced community, an emplaced society on the moon, an emplaced society on Mars in order to sustain that kind of life. And so part of the society building that we're talking about is we'll be bringing others along. We need the techies. Don't get me wrong. We need the techies because the techies are the ones that are going to keep the systems running and understand the trades and the risks. 
But as the society grows, we're going to be bringing more other folks. The, 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 folks, the, the, the folks who enjoy things other than the science and the math. Yeah, and I think Will and I on previous podcasts before I've talked about how, you know, you're going to need psychologists, you're going to need architects, you're going to need, you're going to need people with the skills. Because I think a lot of people believe, well, you say you need the techies. A lot of people believe there's no way I can get involved in space. But just like you said, like as we evolve, as we're getting further and further away, it open, it's opening up to more and more people, which I think is yeah. great. And we need to convince people that that's the case. That is absolutely the case. And you, meant, you mentioned the architects, um, but, but also think about the, the human condition of living in a culture. You're also going to need some rules. Now you're going to get into laws. Now you're going to get into law enforcement and support. Now you're going to get into a government structure. And there's not necessarily a requirement for these types of folks to have science, engineering, math backgrounds in order to sustain the culture. This is coming. And, and working with even historians today on the ground to help build that society is the way you get to work with us because we're already, we're already projecting how do we sustain life on the moon? How do we sustain life on Mars? And we're going to get involved more and more with that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's fantastic. Um, so actually speaking of Mars, I know you're kind of a big Mars guy. You think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think these two things kind of go hand in hand, but, um, are you excited about like the possible colonization of moon and Mars? I think you've already kind of answered this, but uh, the, the answer there is yes, absolutely. For certain. Um, let, let's just talk two aspects of it. There, there are a gajillion aspects, but two aspects jump at you as you begin to delve into the logic of this story. The first aspect is let's talk the techie point part. You go to the moon or Mars. That's the easy thing. I can get you there pretty easily. The hard thing is to get you back. Now, there's a couple reasons why. Um, you are either going to bring all the supplies you possibly could need with you, and that's a lot of mass. A lot of mass means a lot of fuel, which means a lot bigger rocket. It, it, the more fuel is heavier, which means you need more fuel to lift the more fuel that you already have. It's just bad logistics. It's a problem. <clears throat> Or you figure out how to pre-position things cleverly on the moon or Mars so that when you get there, it's there. And or you figure out how to use what is there already. Can I find water, for instance, to live off of? Can I find water so that I can dis disassociate the hydrogen and the oxygen and now I got fuel? If I don't have to bring my own return fuel with me, I'm a much lighter rocket. So there are some engineering trip requirements that you got to play with, which I just enumerated. But then there's the life-sustaining aspect. How much air do I need to bring with me? Can I make my own air there? If I can find water, yes, I can make my own breathable atmosphere. Those kind of things. Um, on the other side of the coin, I want to bring you back alive and healthy. So that means all the exercise that's required to keep you, you know, healthy and, and bones strong enough to not break your ankle when you step on the Mars and you, you're about to make your proclamation, your Neil Armstrong-like proclamation, and the first word we hear is, ouch, I just broke my ankle, is not going to go over well on the newscast, right? So <clears throat> we want to keep you healthy on the long trips. We want to keep you healthy and coming back. We want to reduce your radiation exposure. We want to be able to make sure that you're not going to be breathing in the regolith of, of the moon and causing problems with your lungs and same thing with the sand on Mars. There's, there's bringing you back home healthy makes the engineering solutions slightly more difficult. Is this a good thing? Yeah. If we solve these problems, we can use these solutions here on Earth and it'll help, it'll help society, our cultures today, earthbound cultures today, as we solve these engineering problems for the long trips. Yeah, that's, I think a lot of people, I, and I always, I try to say this all the time, Will and I both, but the things we do in outer space, this was a problem in the, during the Gemini, you know, Apollo era, where people were, well, why are we going up there when there's so many things that can be done down here? And the argument is, and I think it still holds true, is what we're doing up there benefits people down here so much. And Amen. 
And I think this, yeah, I think this, this is like a continuation. And this, this is what we have to keep telling people. And if they look at the history of it and they look at what's come out of the space program, like it's, it's put us miles and miles ahead of people technologically, which helps out everything else. And you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. The easy um, underscoring of that that I can provide you is go ahead and look up NASA spinoffs. Spinoffs is a, is a one word thing. And you can see the um, a- albums, the, uh, what do you call it? almanacs, the yearly almanacs of spinoffs that have come from the, the agency's programs. But just to, to wet the whistle, to underscore what you're saying, is if you are sitting with a cell phone, it came out of the Apollo era. We had to miniaturize things in order to make them light enough, small enough to carry to, to the moon. And a lot, the miniaturization aspect of that program, the emphasis of that program, has brought about smaller and smaller things like cell phones. The computer chip technology, same thing. The, the running athletic uh, shoes that folks are wearing come out of the material sciences that the agency has been working on. Um, heart pumps came out of the NASA agency efforts. The smoke detectors, same sort of thing, came out of the, the need to have those kind of smoke detectors on those vehicles and on the space station. Um, I, I can keep going on and on. Um, the truth of the matter is a lot of what the agency has done has reaped many, many benefits for today's ground cultures. Yeah, and I, I think of, when I think of NASA, I think of, and all astronauts, but I think of solving problems. And that's a lot because of like, you know, you get it a lot in the Martian, like the movie, the book, but he's like, you just got to solve one after the other, one after the other. But that's kind of what it is. You get it in Apollo 13 when they had to, you know, make the air cleaner and And the CO2 scrubber. Yeah. It's about solving problems. And when you solve problems, it benefits everybody. If you take a look at some of the exploration uh, stories, the exploration of the Arctic's Antarctic and the, and the Arctic, if you look, take a look at the Mount Everest climbing expeditions, um, the Amazon ex- ex- exploration, these expeditions always encounter challenges and strifes. And the, the success or the grand failure, and when I say grand failure, I mean you end up losing people or losing the expedition. The success or the loss is based upon how well these expeditions are able to accommodate the losses, to, to work together to overcome the difficulties. And Andy Weir did a nice job of, of demonstrating the difficulties, the strifes of, of an expeditionary behaving, an expeditionary surviving individual in, the, in, the, in his book. And if you take a look at what, what he faces, some of the strifes, he, even the accidents, like when, when, um, the Martian was working outside and ended up shorting out the communication system. These things happen. They just, they're human accidents or incidents that end up having, well, basically life-threatening possibilities. And, and so the expeditions have to be able to accommodate those things. Yes. Good call. Yeah. And I say it all the time. The human aspect of space is my favorite part. Yeah. yeah. It's all about us. It's all about us. It's all about us. The, we do send robots and it's, and, yeah. and we can live, this sounds science fiction-y, but we can live side by side with the robots, but it's a lot um, more cost effective to send these reconnaissance devices, the robots, the satellites, to go see where we're going to land on, on the moon and Mars, to see what areas might be profitable for being able to develop for greater radiation protection, for instance, or where the water flows could have been. Um, there are reasons to work with robots, but the real benefit and the real challenge is going to come sending humans there. The robot can be walking or rolling across the, the terrain, but it's going to be the astronaut who's going to take that step and say, hey, that last step I just took didn't feel like the previous step. Something's different about where I just stepped. And in the human recognition of those change in variables is going to provide us the ability to interact more in that environment. Colonel Kramer, I, I, I had a question that kind of developed, or it's been developing for a while, but what you guys are just talking about, it kind of relates to it. Um, do you think, like, you guys are talking about how when we're solving these problems that come up as a result of trying to colonize Mars, for example, uh, we kind of, like, have to solve problems we didn't previously know we had to solve, right? And I feel like with some of these cases, 
we could just be working independently on solving a an isolated problem, correct? Do you think you think there's there's some added value in having that apply to a project like like one of our favorite projects upcoming is Osiris Rex, and I think I, I read something about um, how that was going to help the 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 uh, problems encountered in getting Osiris Rex to touch down on, a, on an asteroid and then come back to Earth, we're going to help with other missions relating to that. And I thought, why can't we just solve that problem in an isolated case? Why is that, why is that necessary to have, you know, these extended scenarios? So I don't know that we need to, so my, my first answer, I don't know what, that we need to have extended scenarios. I would say Osiris Rex solution for a specific asteroid builds skills and awareness and tools that we can then go by module take that over and go solve another problem. It, it's going to be part of the stepping stone for the greater suite of tools that we have to extend our ability to solve problems for the longer durations. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I think that makes me think of um, like Mercury to Gemini to Apollo. They were just building blocks to get to the moon, but each of them helped in their own way. And whereas Osiris Rex, Osiris Rex is kind of the new, it's the new space, it's the commercial age. Um, but it may, it may, you know, it could benefit everyone, but it's definitely part of the commercial age. And that kind of brings me to my next question is we've, you know, ever since Bob and Doug have gone up to the ISS on board the um, Falcon 9, the Crew Dragon, uh, we've, we've said we're in the commercial space age. And do you have any like comments on, like, how do you feel about the commercial space age? Yeah, I think it's, an, I think it's necessary. Um... Let me lay that as the thesis, and then I got to back up and say some things. We got to be able to do it in a in a careful and deliberate manner. Uh, as soon as we start putting pink fleshy bodies on vehicles, and we're going to launch them, we we need to be certain that our that our individuals are able to have a a reasonable chance. At, of success and returning home safely. Otherwise, it, it's going to be thwarting our whole impetus. So to, to give credit where credit is due, um, specifically for Bob and Doug, SpaceX worked with us um, pretty intimately regarding uh, visibility into their systems, visibility into their oversight, visibility into their safety processes, and making sure that our professional astronauts w were, were going to be able to make a journey that was mitigating the risks that they had to face. And that's critical. Now that I have laid, laid that out, um, when you get right down to it, low Earth orbit is a great place to go, is a great place to do research, is a great place to do developmental research as well. Um, but if we're going to start going farther and farther away, we need the resources and the ability of governmental level of, in, of investment to be able to, to go that far. It, to put it bluntly, space travel is not cheap. And it's difficult. And the resources that governments can bring are um, broader than an individual or an individual company. Now, I'm not saying that Elon and SpaceX can't do that. But generally, if you're going to allow the governments to go farther and farther away and, and increase our sphere of influence um, to a greater and greater distances and, and radii, governments can, can work on that together and bring in the, the resources and the assets of multiple governments to do that, while commercial companies come behind and start populating low Earth orbit. And we can do that with you know, an, a, building a future space station, or if we get to the point where it, it's able to handle, the commercial element is able to handle space tourism. You can bring, you know, something, a rudimentary a hotel that you can fly people up to, for instance. I mean, I'm just thinking out all the time ahead at the moment. But that, all that stuff is low Earth orbit, and commercial companies can definitely do that. So there, there is a very tangible place where they can contribute. Yeah, that's, I think that's interesting because my follow-up was going to be that uh, we had a whole episode about SpaceX Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. And I'm a big Virgin Galactic fan because they want to get people up there like me and Will. You know, they want to get people who really enjoy it up to space, like have a chance to have that mm -hmm. experience. And they're, they want to be like the first 
tourism. They want to have a hotel up there and they want to, you know, have all those things. And I think that's valuable because it's very good for inspiring people. Um, it gives something, something ordinary people to look forward to. Um, and so I think it's cool that you like brought that up that they have a, they have a spot in the, in space. A absolutely. Um, and harkening back to your his uh, historian question earlier, I would love to be able to, to have you come up and join us and see what uh, microgravity feels like, what you can see from, from that vantage point, so that when you return, you're able to share with your history student, uh, either those that you're teaching or those that you're sharing with, um, some of the wonder and, and why we are doing this. And, and add that chapter of history to, to the Humankind History Book. Hey, just... just Put me in for a slot that, on the next one. You got you going go. up. I mean, please, you know, I won't, I won't, you know, I won't be. No, I understand. Upset. I understand. You know, it's, I have to come up. If I have to come up, I won't be. You're a upset. giver. Yeah, I'm a giver. I'm a giver. But yeah. Oh gosh, I'll tell you what. I did get a little chills there when you said I'd love to. Have oh, you come good. Up. I was like, it was like I'd love to have you come over to the house. Like, <laughs> but um, so speaking of the house, the house up in space. Yeah, Just a little up time up there. Uh, yeah. 163 days, or it was like 161 days with two days of travel. Right. Right. Yeah. So, how was your time in space on board the International Space Station, and what did you do up there? So let me um, let me take that question and twist it just a little bit, and start with the what I did up there. Um, each day falls into a couple of different buckets. The first bucket I'll mention is exercise. We exercise about two hours, two and a half hours a day. Um, and, and that is needed as a mechanism that we can use to help combat the weightlessness. Um, for instance, even as you walk around today, how much stress you put on your walking, how much stress your, your skeleton system feels causes dynamic reformation of, of, your, of your bones. Well, if you're not doing that, the bones go, hmm, I don't really need this calcium anymore. See you, bye. So what we wanted, and you get brittle, you end up causing an osteoporotic condition. So what we wanna do when we're up there is appropriate weightlifting. So we're stressing the bones so we don't lose as much calcium as, as fast. We also work on aerobic exercise, biking and running, because you need to be able to stress your system in order to keep it healthy for when you return. And not only, we're also not only worried about the planned return 161 days later, 163 days later, but what happens if we have to bail out and now we're stuck? We haven't been exercising all along. Um, and if we have to bail out and we return someplace in the world and maybe a couple days before rescue forces get to us, we need to be able to handle our own um, conditions. So two and a half hour, two to two and a half hours a day of, of exercise. Um, then we also do maintenance. And the maintenance is either something's broken, we're fixing it, or we're doing preventative maintenance so that it doesn't break. That makes good sense, right? We got a lot of equipment up there. And then the other portion is we're doing research. Um, whether it's taking Earth observation photographs out the windows, which is a great thing to do, and looking out the windows is a wonderful pastime for anybody up there. It's just spectacular. The, um, or we're, we're setting up and, and, and helping ground researchers execute the research that they've been working on and developing for years. Um, for instance, we can be putting together their experiment on board and running it, or once the experiment is up and running, we could be changing out the variables. We can change out the samples for them or go fix something that, is, that has been broken. So that's generally what the, the workday is broken down into. Now, um, you mentioned a, a couple of things that made me want to take your question and turn it around a little bit because it's easier for me to answer. And that is, you know, how was it up there, basically? What, what I remember are three big areas. First and foremost, the camaraderie of the crew that I was with was outstanding. Let me explain. When we launched, the three of us launched... Um, we were heading to space station and there were two guys up on, up on board, Max and, and Jeff, um, one Russian and one American. When we got up there, the five of us uh, bonded pretty quickly and enjoyed each other immensely. There was a lot of teasing, a lot of humor. 
Um, but we would have shared meals at dinner. We, the, we would come down to the, the U.S. segment and have dinner in, in the U.S. half um, for, for the supper meal. We would have lunches down in, in the Russian segment. But during the dinner meal, we would watch American news. We would watch Russian news. We would look at today's schedule to see where there are pinch points and we could have helped out each other. We would look at tomorrow's schedule to see where the pinch points are going to be and who might be needing the help. It was a very strong bonding environment. Two or three days before Max and Jeff returned, Max went very quiet. He was, he was sad about leaving station and it's not leaving space. He was sad about leaving his friends. And uh, one of my crewmates was a Japanese uh, astronaut. Um, after our flight, we did a post-flight public relations tour in Japan that he arranged. And, and Suichi brought all of us uh, to Japan. And when Max saw me in the the uh, Narita airport in Tokyo, he picked, he stands about a foot shorter than I am. He picked me up like a rag doll, shook me from left to right, put me down and there were tears on his cheeks. I mean, the bonding, the, the absolute camaraderie was, was better than what I experienced in the military. It was astounding. The second thing I remember most is um, looking out the windows. Uh, when we were there, we were able to get installed uh, Node 3, and then on the bottom, the nadir side of Node 3, we put uh, the cupola. The cupola is a seven-window window to the world that has covers on the outside. And so you can close the covers, so it's, it's kind of dark in there. We also got visited by three space shuttles, so three times seven. That's 21 crew members who had never looked out the, the, uh, the cupola windows. So I would occasionally bring in one crew member by them, had to be by themselves, brought in one crew member by themselves to the cupola and say, close your eyes. And then I would open up all seven covers of the window. Open your eyes. And every single time I did that, they cried. It is astoundingly, overwhelmingly, impressively, mind-blowingly, heart-stoppingly, breathtakingly beautiful. It is just, a, it is a blessing to be able to go and look out the windows from orbit. The third thing that I'll tell you is um, floating is really, really cool. Floating is really cool. <laughs> and, and, you, and you go through different stages of pr proficiency of, of, uh, of floating, of, of drifting in microgravity, and it, it became a game. You know, can I do this exercise? Can I translate from where I am right now to over there without using any of my hands? In fact, it was my goal to go from the nose of station to the tail of station without using my hands at all. And I did it eventually by the end. Um, also, you can be standing there on a conference and you look up and you see a handrail that's up there and you go, huh, I wonder if I can flip up there and have my feet go right into the handrail without using my hands. So, I mean, play a little games and, and you, and a, at about the two month mark, you become a professional floater. And it's just, it's a blast. It's like you're a kid, man. <laughs> So those are the three things I remember from, from the mission. That's awesome. Uh, I have two spinoffs of that. Um, okay. The one thing would be, uh, you talk about a lot about being inside the International Space Station floating around. Did you do more work inside or outside? Like, did you ever do any external work on the International Space Station? No, I was trained to. Um, in fact, there was a problem with one of the pump systems outside that I, when I started reading the reports, I went, oh, we're going to have to go fix that. So... There was talk about us going out to do um, a repair spacewalk, but uh, clever engineers on the ground figured out a way to unstick a valve, basically. So consider two valves in series. The upstream valve, they increased the pressure, and they opened the valve. And then with, the, with basically the water hammer effect, you got a high-pressure fluid, rams into the, the downstream valve, and it shook it awake and loosened it up and fixed it. So we didn't have to go out. <laughs> so the bottom line is we, we trained to, we almost had to, we didn't go. There you go. The, um, the, way, the way you just talked about them, like basically they hit it with some water and it made it, it reminds me of the lunar rover duct tape situation. Yeah, yeah. Just put some duct tape on it, fold yep. a couple maps together and make a, make a bumper and keep on going. Yeah. You keep on going. Yep. It, it was pretty brilliant. I mean, so when you do a spacewalk, there's an awful lot of overhead of hours of preparation. Then you do the spacewalk and then hours of, of basically cleanup and getting ready for the next 
use, right? So if we don't have to go do a spacewalk, uh, we avoid the increased risk. We, we, we don't have to use all that time that we could be using for research and, and payloads and science and stuff. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was like such a, I, I mean, it should be an event. I guess I just didn't think about it as much. Yep. Yeah. I, you, you said that you like the way you became an astronaut was like each decision, like how can I do the hard way, right? What's the hard way? I guess I never thought that as an astronaut, you could be thinking about something harder that you're going to do. But I imagine you had something in mind when you were up there the whole time. Um, to be honest with you, during the execution of the mission, my, my interest and my um, focus was on trying not to have a procedure named after me. Oh, don't pull a TJ. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, it wasn't that I was trying to, to do something harder. It was, I, I wanted to do well for all the researchers on the ground whose experiments I was touching. I wanted to do well for all the engineers who are basically allowing me to live and work on their space station and so I can keep it in good order. Hmm. I think um, a little thing, I'm not super sure, but I think a lot of people aren't sure. So when you're talking about experiments, who's sending experiments up there? Are you allowed to say or no? Like, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thanks for being sensitive. I'm, I'm not giving, you know, proprietary information away by, by sharing. There, a bunch of researchers around the world submit their research proposals for microgravity environments. So this is an opportunity. I'll get to your question, but let me explain. Why do research on space station? Like, can't we do research on the ground? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can do research on the ground. But on the ground, you have not except for some limited second or two ability to remove the effect of gravity from your equation. So in space station, you're always in free fall. We have a couple of drop towers on the ground that give you a small, tiny little experiment, an opportunity to be in free fall for a second or two or three. Um, but the space station's always in free fall going around the earth. As a result, we can remove the effect of gravity equation set. And the candle is in its traditionally romantic teardrop shape. That teardrop shape is an effect of gravity. Let me share with you that the cold air on the outside of the room is heavier and pushes down and the warm air is lighter so that it gets pushed upward and we get this um, a convection effect that elongates the flame. It's a beautiful flame, but it's disturbing the experimental environment. I can't perfectly probe the perfect flame to perfectly understand the perfect combustion process because it's being disturbed by convection. Take that flame to orbit, and now I've removed gravity from that environment. And that flame no longer burns as a teardrop shape. It burns as a perfect sphere. It doesn't burn for very long, that's another problem, but, but it burns spherically. And so now I've got undisturbed, non-convectively disturbed, perfect symmetry uh, flame that I can probe and understand how to perfectly understand that perfect combustion process so I can perfectly maximize it to do things like improve internal combustion engine combustion processes. So we can reduce, we can, we can maximize that, that, that developmental driving force or to perfectly, not perfectly, but to, to improve the combustion processes in factories so they put out less soot or turn it around. Maybe I want to not improve the combustion process, but I want to, improve the process by which we extinguish the flame to make that better. And then you start leading towards things like fire retarding clothing to make them better for, for firefighters and stuff. So by, by taking your experiment and putting it in a microgravity environment, you're able to remove gravity from the, from the situation. So um, given that many researchers around the world submit to a pro and an influx that gets uh, reviewed by, by NASA agency folks 
to be able to brought, be brought in as a technical demo. Maybe we want to try some new technical stuff. Maybe they want to bring in as NASA research projects themselves or through um, a, another channel, which ends up being largely cases, um, the science and space folks, that they then have their vetting process and say, hey, NASA, we think these experiments are really good for you to consider manifesting and bringing the space station. Awesome. Yeah, because when I think about experiments in space, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're doing experiments up there. But... Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think yeah. a lot of people know what's happening up there. And it's harder when you don't know to see how it improves, you know, you know, mankind. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So, so if I can spin off on that, no pun intended with spinoffs, but spin off on that goodness for mankind. One of the things I mentioned was uh, technical demos. We, for instance, we have the ability on, on board to recycle um, moisture, recycle water. So today's coffee can be tomorrow's coffee if you get that recycling thing there. Um, but, but that, that, that process by which we cleanse and make water potable, that device we've taken to third world countries to help make potable water. We've taken that device to um, disaster areas where, where the water system is broken down and now we have just yucky water and we, we're gonna use that yucky water and clean it and make it into potable water. So technical um, tech demos, we're learning how to, to make things usable for space station for longer missions to moon and Mars, but we're also taking, bringing them back home too, to be able to use to help ground folks. You're muted. That's a great example. I didn't know that one about the, uh, the water purification. That's, that's awesome. Yep. The, um, uh, so, so people as they age will experience osteoporosis and some folks and some gender, you know, the ladies tend to experience a, a good bit of osteoporosis. Can we combat that? Some of the medicines w that we can be taking in order to be part of the experiments, we're able to bring back home and go, Hey, this will help osteoporotic conditions. These exercises will help combat osteoporosis. So we're doing it not only because we're interested in going farther away, but we're also doing it to try to help folks on the ground. Awesome. And then my second spinoff question from when you were talking about your time, when you, you said like when you brought astronauts to look out at the, uh, the earth for the first time that they like broke down, my question was going to be, has being in space changed your perspective of earth? And I think it seems like it does a little bit for everybody, but. Change it. I, first, I, I don't know if it changed. I, I enhanced is probably better. I know this is pretty special, right? I, I know we are a rock hurtling through space with a very, very thin atmosphere to help protect us and a magnetic field to help protect us from radiation. I know this, but it just doesn't quite hit you until you look out and you go, oh my. And, just, and you see how beautiful this blue marble is. And I think a lot of people, today, it's a lot of people look at Earth and Mars and they're like, why are you going to Mars when like the Earth, like the, the Earth needs our help. And we're like, I, and I, I try to tell them, you know, the interplanetary species and everything, but the things we're doing there, the things we're learning about Mars and about other planets will help us understand the origins of the earth and kind of of ourselves. And so it all, it's kind of all encompassing. Um, but I think very, very much, very much so you, you nailed it. I mean, yes, the dinosaurs would like to have had a second planet to be living on. So they wouldn't have gone extinct. Mm -hmm. And we have the same problem of having all our eggs in the same basket. So that, that would be helpful from a species survival aspect to have humans on different um, bodies, heavenly bodies. Um, but, but you also mentioned a key thing. It's, it's not like we're taking 100% of the government's resources to go do what we're doing. In fact, we are a very small percentage of the GNP in terms of what we're working with. So it's not by us doing the research and development by us doing the engineering to go farther, we're not the primary percentage of any budget anywhere. It's a small budget with a high return on investment. That's the first thing. The second thing is we wouldn't have this country if Spain hadn't launched Christopher Columbus. And they didn't, they weren't perfect. Their society had problems too. 
but they, you know, funded that exploration. And that sort of same concept is you're trying to bring back to the home world goodness. And by our NASA spinoffs, we've been doing it for decades. That's off. It kind of feels like a, like a pulling yourself up by your bootstraps thing, you know, like we're, we're going to reach higher and then, I don't know, it's kind of going to drag us all up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So yeah. I, I, had to th I had to throw Christopher Columbus in for the historian part. No, yeah, it's fantastic. Cause <laughs> I talk about him all the time. I almost wrote my thesis on exploration and I was going to link it to space, but uh, I decided to do like the origins of like commercial space <laughs> in America. Good. But yeah, yeah. The, um, you answered my question, which was, you know, do you believe space exploration is important? And it's a kind of a ridiculous question to ask a astronaut, but. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think my best answer is I, I think I've answered it for a number of reasons, right? Yeah. Both, both the challenges that we want to be able to, to impart to our world um, with the solutions that we, we are able to use and, and come up with to solve the problems. They're not just for the mission, they're also for the people on the ground. There's economic benefits because we are investing. And when I say investing, I'm talking about we put a number of dollars into something, but we're getting a lot back because of it, but technically a lot back because of it. And then for the society of humans in general, we're also helping to protect the, the, the species itself. And we learn so much medically from what we're doing. Yeah. My oh, gosh, that's awesome. Uh, if you, if the listeners don't understand, uh, we're talking to an astronaut, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm loving it every second. Uh, but an astronaut now who is a flight director. Yes, sir. And so Will and I had a little conversation before, and we were talking about a flight director, the flight director, um, and we we're wondering what exactly does a flight director do at NASA. Mm. My best answer in the shortest amount of time is, did you see the movie Apollo 13? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So Gene Kranz, the guy who's attributed at to saying failure is not an option, he, he never really said it, but he did say he wished he said it because it's a great quote. But <laughs> the, in the movie, Gene Kranz is the guy who says failure is not an option, and he is in charge of the, of, of the mission. That's the flight director. Gotcha. All right, cool. So would you say astronaut, flight director, is there, a, is there one over the other? Um, a little, yes, yes and no. Is, I know that sounds like I'm sitting on the fence, but I really enjoy the astronaut world, the astronaut mission, the, um, the ability to involve folks because of the perspective of being an astronaut. I enjoy a lot of that. And it was really fun. Don't, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the training. I enjoyed working together. I enjoyed the mission. I enjoyed the views. I enjoyed the environment. I thought it was important. Um, the truth of the matter is being an astronaut, it's on the tip of the spear, but there's a whole spear behind it, right? Mm. Hop the fence. And as a flight director, we are keeping the crews safe. We're keeping the vehicle safe. We're enabling the crews to do the mission that they're going for. And we're involving an awful lot more folks as, a, as an entity, as a team, to make that happen. That's what we're doing. We are the directors of that team. And that's a, a, a bigger contribution in many respects to enable the astronauts to do the mission that they're going up for. So a little bit of both. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I feel like especially now that you're like a veteran astronaut things like my the thing I always want to do, I want to teach, I want to like, you know, help others do things. And I know that that's not like your job at being a flight director, but as an astronaut, somebody like, you know what it's like to do what you've done. And it's kind of like the next step. It seems like, like you're helping out. You're like, you're making a difference still, which is great. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, what I have said casually to folks that, not either tour, you know, tour folks around and stuff. I had a really fun time as an astronaut. Now I'm doing the hard work. Hmm. So now you're doing the behind the tip of the spear. Yeah, exactly. I'm the shaft and the whole launching capability of the spear. You know, that's us. Nice. Yeah.
I think I'm gonna start using that. The tip of the spear back, the right yeah. the whole spear, the whole spear. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Will, any any questions you came up? Yeah, I. This kind of relates more back to your time on the space station, as we just established, might not be the most as meaningful maybe as what you're doing now. But it occurred to me, you, have, if, if I'm not mistaken, you have a master's in physics, right, from yep, MIT. Yep. Yep. I was wondering, when, when does that education come into play? Obviously, it helps to have a science background to do science experiments. Mm -hmm. But like, when when do you did you find your education specifically helped you do what you're doing? So. I can't point my finger to a specific experiment or a specific maneuver, but the, <laughs> the bottom line is everything we do is physics. So from, from my perspective, the fact that we are doing um, orbital mechanics, we're, we're doing the rocket equation and living through it directly applies to the background. It's to be clearest and to be fairest to the education the ability to think in, in that disciplined manner and understand the, the bigger picture is really what the intense uh, studies have enabled folks. It's, it's really a disciplined ma manner of thinking and approaching the problem solving um, for the problems that we're being faced with. Hmm. Problem solving, maybe. Yeah. Problem solving. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we're getting to that point where we're about to ask you the, the fun. Oh, you just went muted. There you go. Oh. I, lo I lost. Say it again. Oh, we're getting to the point where we're about to ask you the fun questions. Oh, okay. Bring it on. None of these have been fun so far. It's just been, <laughs> <laughs> it's been nothing. But so a personal favorite of ours to always start off with is if you read them, what is your favorite science fiction book? So you're, you're asking... I do read them, by the way. Um, you're asking a, a question that is not really answerable. The topic is a, is a little bit uh, broader than that. And I'll simply leave you with um, the, a thought. I contend that science fiction, the birth of science fiction, has helped us get to where we are now. So let, let, I, can, I can go through the history of science fiction, starting with basically Beowulf, right? So, you know, we're talking back in about 900 AD. I can bring you forward in the next, you know, 17 hours or so and, and bring you a, <laughs> through the, the history of science fiction. But back in, you know, literally back in Beowulf, we, we had this monster called Grendel, which is the embodiment of ignorance and, and fear and, and the the the, the, sold, the the warriors had to go out and conquer their fears. So that's kind of where it starts. But if you fast forward to the mid 1800s, when the genre was really beginning to to be born, and you ended up having Jules Verne and H. G. Wells and Edgar Rice Burroughs writing epic stories about sister planets, either Venus or Mars, and and the creatures we'd find there, and and they would even come and invade, you know, Earth or the worlds. Um, and what, what those stories could bring, you started springing imagination forth. And people began wondering, like in the Grendel days, what is out there? What can we go do? Can we go conquer the ignorance that, that we have? And as you, as you fast forward a little bit farther, you get into the early 1900s, 1890s, I think we had a, a, a quick um, motion picture little thingy. But as you, as you step into the early 1900s, you begin to start seeing um, the advent of uh, the trailers. You know, back in the early days of the movie houses, the movie houses would tease you into coming to the next movie by leaving you with a running story. They would give you a little chapter. And they would, of course, leave that chapter in a cliffhanger. So if you wanted to see the rest of that story, you had to come back and pay for more money the next movie that they were going to house, and they would run another trailer. Um, but things like that were occurring in the early 1900s to, in, to include science fiction stuff. And, for instance, um, we had bad guys collecting sun rays and focusing it down and burning um, the, through a safe to get to the money. So even though it wasn't really lasers, it's directed energy, and we didn't start lasing until 1964. Um, the guy who 
wrote a book about his girlfriend being captured by aliens and absconded across the solar system, he developed something that is so like radar to track the aliens going away that when Sir Watson Watt applied for his patent for the radar, the patent office has said, no, it's just like the book. It's just like the movie. Um, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is the folks who were writing science fiction in the mid 1800s to the early 1900s and then beyond with movies started setting the imagination. So I can't give you a single book. It's this movement. And if you take a look at some of the big guys, the Russian mathematician Tsiolkovsky, born during this and grew up during the same time frame of science fiction development. Um, uh, Goddard, same, same time frame. Um, Werner von Braun, same time frame. I would contend that they saw and read these books and the imaginations grew bigger. And not the question of why, but why aren't we doing this? Fast forward to... Uh, 1951, and there's a movie called Destination Moon, where um, base, moon bases were, were built there to rain down um, missiles on bad guys on the Earth. This is the predecessor to the ICBM problem. Also in 1951, when worlds collide, we had a wayward star. Don't get me started on the physics, but just roll with it. A big heavenly body uh, heading towards Earth. How do you defend the Earth from a um, from this wayward body coming towards you and, and leap forward to 1990s, uh, Edward Teller and his cronies at Lawrence Livermore developed a planetary defense system using explosive, uh, nuclear explosives to help protect the Earth from, from that kind of thing. And then in 1964, there was a, a movie, a story called Marooned, where there was a U.S. crew up in orbit, there was a Soviet crew up in orbit, and the, the U.S. crew had a problem that would take them, you know, three days to fix. I don't remember the duration, but a lot of the time. And they only had like two days worth of oxygen left. And the, uh, the Russians, the Soviets, did a spacewalk, delivered more oxygen so that the crew on orbit could solve their problem and come home safely. This is the beginning of the interactions with the uh, Soviet Union and Russia how we got to Apollo Soyuz, how we got to the International Space Station. The story here, what I'm telling you is I can't put my finger on a single title, but it's this whole genre that builds imagination. Folks thinking about why not, and now we're beginning to make those why nots happen. Those kind of things. Oh, let me just leave you. You guys have watched Star Trek, right? Yeah. Yeah. Captain Kirk, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So Captain Kirk, he, he beams down to the planet, whatever he's planning on, right? He, and he pulls from his pocket and opens up, what's it called? Oh, I don't know. I forget. I forget what it's in called. This, it, it, communicator. Yeah. The, yeah the, he, he opened his communicator, right? No, that's his cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, te he tells Mr. Spock, scan the area to find out if there are any bad guys around. And Mr. Spock uses his... Oh, you're testing us. I don't know. Tri tricorder, right? He uses his tricorder and scans. I'm saying that's a smartphone. <laughs> and then on Captain Kirk's show, the yeoman brings Captain Kirk the ship's log to sign in pencil or pen, uh -huh. using a pen. Okay. Now, fast forward to Jean-Luc Picard. The yeoman brings Captain Picard the ship's log on a tablet, like yeah, yeah. today's awesome. tablets. So here, here we have imagination being used to spur us to go farther. So you asked me a tough question. It's not a single title, but a seven-minute answer because it's the genre that's causing us to think in, in imaginative ways, inspiring us to, to get what we don't have now. You do this fantastic thing where I ask you a question and then you answer like three of my questions. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's awesome because one, I love that question because everybody always has a different mm. uh, interpretation. But then the question I always follow that up with is, does science fiction play a part, important part in space exploration? And you just answered that. You're, you said it's like the inspiration, like it brings these people to do these things. And that's why I love about it. 
I mean, it brought me to do this. I mean, behind Good. me, I don't know how many people are going to see this, but, you know, I got Marvel, I got Lord yep. of the Rings, you know, all these things that have, you know, they have, they have, it's just inspiration. And I think like stories and stuff like that are so important. They're great. I, I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And one aspect of science fiction that I think is key is that we can include people who are not science, math, engineering techies. Mm-hmm. It, and I would even go so far as to say, science, math, engineering techies aren't always the people who write these stories. Yeah. And, and they're helping society go, go think about this and get, get farther away, get farther along our path of getting farther away. Yeah, well, when you started bringing us through the history of science fiction, um, I was like thinking, you know, we're gonna do a whole science fiction episode, like a panel, we're gonna have people come on. I mean, you're, you, you'd blow mm. us out of the water, maybe. <laughs> but uh, we'd love to have you back for that one. But uh, I got two more questions for you. Go for it. So this is another one where this one gets like, some good answers. But where do you see human beings in 100 years? <clears throat> that is always the first response. 100 years is a little bit farther out than I can forecast. Um, if everything goes right... Uh, let's say by 2040, we should have humans on Mars. Okay. And I would take it a little bit farther than that and go, we will probably have sustainable human life on the moon, striving for sustainable human life on Mars. And then we start taking a look at, at the moons of the uh, gas giants that are habitable with uh, water resources if, if the radiation environment isn't too bad. Um, and we start looking at those as, as resources to start exploring. Gotcha. Yeah, sign me up for a, for a real estate on Titan. There you go. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then I think Space Chams is all about informing, educating, inspiring. We, we shoot for a, we shoot for a, a, a like, we want to inspire the, the, the next generation but there's, everybody has a little space in them. You know, everybody has that, you know, there's no, there's no age requirement to have a, a, an, a love for space, but how do we inspire the younger generation to care about space? Like what, what is it? Like, what do we have to do? Do you think in your opinion? Um, a little bit it has to be accessible. So how do you make something accessible that is difficult to do? Well, the first thing I'd start off with is, exposing folks to the stories, the science fiction stories that we're talking about, the science fiction shows, you get people wondering why we aren't there in the cities of tomorrow that we've been forecasting for a long time. <clears throat> and you expose the why nots. And then as we get a little bit farther along, we need the experiential taste. As we get commercial low earth orbit access, whether it's, private astronaut missions, whether it's tourist um, journeys to hotels that are in low Earth orbit, you begin making it experientially available. And I think as soon as you do both of those, you're beginning to to bait the hook and set the hook um, for the future generations. There you go. Wisdom from an astronaut. (laughs) Well, this has been awesome. And I'll be honest, I was freaking out like, 30 minutes before this. Well, I was freaking out the past five days, but uh, I was hoping this Zoom would work. I was hoping everything, like, I was like, gosh, please let it work. Cause I, you know, it was like, I don't want to, like you on the space station, not quite the same, but I was like, I don't want to make this like a thing. Like he's going to be mad at me, but this was awesome. Was I'm glad. Fantastic. Thank, and then we know you're busy and thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, you know, you're always welcome. And I'll, I'll, I'll look for my invitation to the space station in the mail. <laughs> uh, that sounds like it. In fact, I think I put it in <clears throat> just recently. Okay, good, good. To, yeah. to thank and you for that. If there's a plus one, I'll bring Will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Will, brothers, you got anything else? Space. <clears throat> no, I just, honestly, there's, there's no other way to put it. I, uh, thank you for deigning to, to be on our little program here. It's, it has been awesome. Fantastic. My, my pleasure, guys. And, and no, no kidding, I, I've enjoyed. Um, I, I've enjoyed your perspective. And I look forward to, to getting the link for, you, for the podcast for this. Awesome. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. If you tuned in this far, let us know on the next Instagram post we got. Um, hey, 
Always remember to keep looking up. And we're out of here.